Good evening, everybody, and welcome once again to the Muzzle is Off podcast. I am your host, Nakia Monet, and we have a very special guest with us today. We have Dr. David Glover with us today, and we are going to truly continue on with our conversation of it is in the church and the road to healing. Um, I would just like for everybody to please like, share, follow, whatever you need to do. But uh, we truly want this conversation to be heard uh, with a, a, a wide range of people for, for a wide range of people, just due to the fact that, you know, uh, for this past month, we have really been talking about topics um, that have truly um, affected um, a lot of people that have been in the church. And um, I think that it is important that um, we have this discussion, that we have an open and honest discussion, and that people begin to understand the heart of people um, that truly do love God, but have experienced some things in the church. And I don't think that it is negative that we are discussing things that have occurred to people in the church. I think that it should be viewed as something that is actually positive and uh, something that can actually be redemptive and it can be uh, actually restored restorative um, for the simple fact that if we don't discuss what has happened, how do we heal? Mm -hmm. How do we find our road to healing? Mm -hmm. How do we acknowledge that, you know, something happened? How do we accept responsibility for what happened? Mm -hmm. um, how do we accept accountability for what happened? So that is the reason why I decided to do this topic. And I'm going to continue doing this topic mm -hmm. because uh, the issue is, is that the more we talk about it, the more we can actually bring those that are the responsible party, those that are the accountable party um, to the forefront so that they can begin to see that there are some things that honestly need to change. And I think change is good. Mm -hmm. um, I think change is needed. Mm -hmm. And I think that it is about time that we truly do begin to remove the muzzle and take the muzzle off and begin mm -hmm. to have open and honest conversation concerning what has actually troubled, you know, some people in the church. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people know my story or whatever. And there are a lot of people who don't, but at the same time, um, I tell it openly and I tell it honestly, right? Mm -hmm. And I tell it that way for the simple fact that I believe that it is imperative that people understand that even though something extremely negative, extremely heartbreaking, extremely uh, discouraging could have happened to you in the church, that does not mean that it takes your heart away from God. It doesn't mean that it pulls you away from your purpose. It doesn't mean that it, um, you know, causes you to, uh, you know, renege or it causes you to fall back. But mm -hmm. sometimes it does cause you to go into question. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's right. what we're really and truly be discussing today. Um, as we summarize everything that has truly taken place this month of it um, has happened in the church. And mm -hmm. I wanted to have Dr. David Glover on because um, I believe that it is important to have someone that is, is, is a representative, right, of the church, mm -hmm. but not only just a representative, you're also a um, licensed psychologist. You, are, you have a doctorate in psychology. So mm -hmm. I believe that it is important because when we begin to um, understand certain things that have taken place, a lot of this formally forms has formed in the mind, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And it has formed in the emotional state and it has mm -hmm. formed, you know, in the mental state of a person, right? Mm -hmm. And then what happens is it then begins to affect or infect a body, Okay. Mm -hmm. you know? And I just think that it is important for us to have a, a well-rounded discussion surrounding that and okay. in and out of itself, because when we begin to understand the mind, we begin to understand the actions mm -hmm. and not that we condone it. Right. Right. But we begin right. to understand it and see. And right. then we'll be able to recognize the type of leadership or the okay. type of church that we're actually in. And okay. you will then begin to you, you you'll then be able to make wise decisions yes. concerning where you are, you know, and where you're actually being fed. And, and and I think that in and out of itself is important because a lot of times we see certain signs about these houses and some people and we don't necessarily recognize it. 
Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Glover, go ahead and introduce yes. yourself. Come on, sir. Well, I am um, Dr. Glover. I um, originally grew up in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, have been in Atlanta for the last, since 2009, um, did complete my doctor's degree in um, psychology, um, as well on the church side, I um, am, um, um, well, I was licensed and ordained um, in the Churches of God in Christ. So, you know, very reputable um, church, Pentecostal church. I grew up very strict, um, cold, very strict, sanctified Pentecostal. You know, I'm from the church where you, when they said a three-day shut-in, we're not talking about you came to church three nights in a row. We're talking about you came to church and locked the door and locked stayed it. 72 hours and you did not eat. And, you, you know, and this was not a one-time a year thing. This was something that was ongoing, um, a revival that may have lasted a whole month. You know, so I grew up in that, those strong roots um, of uh, Pentecostalism um, from back in the day. So... Um, it's been a quite a journey, quite a journey. So I do, I have gone to seminary, um, you know, as, as my undergrad. So I have a, a, a wide breadth of, um, a background to pull from to have a, a, a perspective and a, an outlook, if you were to say. And I appreciate that outlook and that perspective, which is why we are here today. Mm -hmm. Um, you gave a good brief history concerning you growing up in the Church of God in Christ. Mm -hmm. Three-day revivals. Not to only mention three-day revivals, but you also, if you think about the Church of God in Christ, you also have uh, a lot of conferences. Correct. Yes, there were, there were district. I mean, you have everything. Um, so on the local level, and I was involved in a lot of hierarchies. Um, mm -hmm. So I was on the local level. The local church served, um, went all the way up to co-pastoring um, on the local level, um, running revivals. I was on the district level, which is the next level, where you have a small quorum of, of pastors that come together. And, and then there's the jurisdictional level. I was on that. I did the music department. Um, then the regional level, I did the music department and the evangelist department. So, and then the, on the international level, the national levels, where I, I actually um, served and worked in the both, again, the regional um, or the evangelist department and the music department. So I've seen all levels. I've seen, you know, um, that's as high as you go is to the national level. Now, my, my rank wasn't the highest you can go, but I've served on all of those, in all of those capacities. So I've seen a lot right. of things, good and bad, mm -hmm. good and bad, you know. Um, and so when we talk about church hurt and we talk about um, the road to healing and recovery, um, it, it becomes very, uh, a very, what I've seen is so much talk about church hurt. Mm -hmm. I've heard, we've, we've all heard it, and, and you hear it in messages. Everybody has church hurt. Everybody has, and we all will nod our heads and say yes. Um, or when you talk to somebody who was in church, yeah, I did, I did the church thing, blah, blah, blah. Everybody talks about that. But I have, for every 1,000 times I've heard about church hurt, I'm still missing that one time somebody said church healed. Church healed. I've never, in fact, on my, uh, I did a live, I want to say uh, I did a series from mm -hmm. Church Hurt to Church Healed, because there has to be, if we can label something, and, it's, and I have no problem saying, confessing, understanding the appropriateness, even though some people wordplay the church or like, how can a building hurt you? That's cute. Right. That's fine. And I get it. That's literally true. Yes, we know that a building is not sitting on top of you hurting you. And I think you know that the people saying it are not saying it. So that's just a stalling mechanism because you don't have a real answer. Right. Because that's, that that's, that, that's foolish. I mean, who's mm -hmm. really saying that the whole church hurts you? Everybody knows that, but we are still talking about a reality of what has happened right. in the church. And so, but we have to, there's a time for mourning. Ecclesiastes says for everything, there's a time under the sun. But there's a time for healing. There when, is. when are we getting healed? Because if we don't look at it, if we don't get 
restored or redeemed, as you said, the redemptive part and the restorative part, then we forever go through a cycle of hurting. And if we don't get healed, then the only thing, the adage is true, that hurting people hurt people. So then we just continue the same cycle, inviting more people into the cycle and recycle the old people out of the cycle. Right. But if there's no answer to change this cycle, to break the break cycle, it. then we never we never come into the knowledge and the fullness of why, why Christ came. Because truthfully, he came and his only attack that he had was on the church. Right. The only people he called out of their name, vipers, serpents. I mean, he called them the whole gamut, but it was always the church. He didn't go to no sinner and condemn them. He didn't say, you're going to hell. So he taught us, the church. Even when the tax collector denied him, he didn't say, oh, you're going to hell because you didn't want to give up all your belongings and come follow me. He didn't do that. But and that's part of the reason why I say we have a very, we have a problem learning how to truly exegete the text mm -hmm. and truly and you know what forget exegesis right forget that okay. we have an issue understanding simple English. I think we have a problem thinking. Yeah, that's true. Because the church has not ever taught you to think. No, you're not supposed to think. You're, you're supposed, supposed to, to you're supposed to repeat and obey. That's it. Memorize what I told you. What I said. Mm -hmm. And obey. So you have a whole bunch of people of pastor said, bishop said, mm -hmm. mama, mother said. Mm -hmm. You don't have the word of God being the highlight. You have the tradition of the church, even to the Catholics, saying that the church is higher than. The Pope stood up in 1500s and said, the church is higher than God. Hmm. How? And he said, he said, I'll prove it. We are the only people, he said, the church is the only entity that told its owner, we're going to change what you said and you're going to like it. How did we do it? We told him that we're taking the Sabbath that was created on a Saturday and we're going to change it to a Sunday and you'll be strong, oh God. We, the church did that. We sure did. And now we perpetuate it. And change the scriptures. We're still quoting, saying, "Look, it's the Sabbath. Keep it holy. This is not the Sabbath. You're keeping the, something wrong. Holy. Sunday is not the Sabbath. It's, I mean, and I have no problem. I'm still mm -hmm. going to go to church on a Sunday, right? But I want you to recognize it for what it is. No, recognize the truth, right? And understand we're observing a Sabbath day on a Sunday, mm -hmm. but the Sunday is not necessarily the Sabbath day. It's not. So That's I mean. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's just those small, finite things that we refuse to even look at. Look at the fact that on Sundays, you got a whole bunch of, on first Sundays, you have a whole fleet of people dressed in Roman Catholic outfits. Roman, that's right. Mm -hmm. And you're Christians. But let's even back up further than that. The very fact that you have on this outfit, God, Christ, God said, your, your, your Sabbaths or your, your, your rituals, these outfits you wear, the, the shedding of the bullocks, the heifers, and the sheep, they stink. Hello, because he said... Do you hear me? He didn't say, I don't like them. He said, I, they make me sick. Mm -hmm. But the church still said, but we still going to continue. Mm -hmm. In the thing that makes God sick and said that it is a sacrament unto the Lord. In fact, it stunk so much that he sent his son to outdo it. Hello. And to change it and tear the veil. And we put the veil back together, stitched her, and said, okay, now where were we? Right here. So I don't understand how we, well, and I do understand, because we've never been taught to think. And then when we do think, we are ostracized for the thought. And no, we are demonized. Mm -hmm. You will, Go ahead, because we are demonized. I'm going to say that. I'm going to. Go you're ahead. demonized before you're accepted. Anything that doesn't walk like we said walk, talk like we know talking goes, or sounds different, it's the demon, and we put buckets of blood over it and rebuke it, cast it out, and then we find out, oh, well, that was God. Okay. Woman couldn't wear red. Woman couldn't wear uh, pants. Woman couldn't could preach. Uh, all these foolishness. And we use the scripture to back up each one. Everything. 
So if now when I went to seminary, because the truth is my journey was never that I was one who was trying to figure himself out. I was mm -hmm. completely sold out to homosexuality was going to hell. Yes. I was, it wasn't no change. When I got to Atlanta, it was the same thing. When I went into seminary, same thing. It was in seminary. Not that the people challenged me. God challenged me. Woke me up. God did. Because the people had tried and I, that they failed miserably. Because I had a mouth and I had what I needed. I had my theology and you weren't about to change it. But the only person that could deal with me did deal with me. And that was Jehovah himself. Mm -hmm. that made me pull out my Bible and prove to him in his word that what I was talking about was right. And when I failed, I had nothing else to do. When I failed, I couldn't do nothing but consent and cry because of all of the people that I knew had lost their lives to a lie. And I'm not talking about they left the church. I'm talking about they left this earth. They committed suicide mm -hmm. i know them know or knew them and all i could do is weep because we didn't have the truth and we promoted a lie and we didn't even care forget the fact that even if it was a sin our application of it was nasty and rude That's and disgusting. unloving mm -hmm. Forget, I'm not even going to the part that you didn't even try and say with love and kindness like the Bible told you to. Because the Bible is very clear when it says, with love and kindness, have I yeah, drawn you? Yeah. Forget mm -hmm. that. It, we wanted to shout aloud, scream, um, lift up your voice like a prophet, show their people their transgressions, beat them. That's what we wanted. Because we were hiding under our mess. So we have to amplify your mess. Hmm. And there is a, a, a dichotomous um, psychological breakdown that happens. When I want to deflect, because we talk about it in, in other, but we never take it to the church. Never. Psychology doesn't stop when it comes into the church. Hmm. In fact, it is, it is most needed because we do manipulation. Hello. At the highest level in the church. Judgment is at its highest level in the That's house true. of mercy. Mm -hmm. Get that. The house of mercy has the highest level across all boards of judgment. How did that happen? You see what I'm saying? So for me, but even in all of that, there has to be a place of wholeness. And healing. And healing. And restoration. And the redemptive work of Christ. And so, so in my studies, actually my dissertation for my doctorate degree was on how religious coping mechanisms are used in the LGBT, African-American LGBT community in churches that um, are, that exercise homo negativity. So in the churches that bash you, mm -hmm. how do these gay people survive? How? What, because there, and now I love the study um, because, and I didn't want to do the study. And of course, as, as classic as most people say, uh, the thing I didn't want to do the most was my call. So I didn't want, I didn't want that study. I didn't right. want it at all. But what I found is, in, is, is number one, I had never even heard of religious coping mechanism as it was, you know, portrayed, which is, cause we heard about, okay, when you down, you go to church or mm -hmm. you feel sad, church is my medicine which is very true, and that is coping. But they, these, these um, researchers were able to go and even scrub down. What does that mean? Because there's different levels of what religious coping does. Do you, because we all know that there are people, and you can think in your mind, and sometimes we all have exhibited some of these different levels where sometimes in church, when, you're, when you feel like you're, you're having a bad season, well, what is God trying to teach me? You start you mm -hmm. go into this questioning as into the fault lies within me. Mm -hmm. Or some people go to another um, component, which is I start, okay, God is just showing me um, um, that I need to be closer to activities in the church. So they start using works to prove, God, I am doing what I need to do. I start paying my tithes. Huh? Do you sound familiar? People start, mm -hmm. I, I go start coming back. I'm going to come back to Bible study because God is showing me that I've been slacking off. You know, so we believe that the work portion brings us closer to God. Or is God punishing me for something connected to me? 
Right. Who around me? We use that Aiken. Who is it? Who is it in the camp that has sin? Because now it's all on all of us. Oh, Jonah. We go to no, the no. Jonah. We stick to Jonah and Joshua. Uh-uh. We about uh -huh. to wave this right in front of you. Hello. Somebody, and with somebody, somebody gonna know. We're gonna find out. Be very sure. We'll pull out that scripture. Now you used to love that scripture. I still kind of like it. Be sure your sin will find you out. We go into that doom and gloom. And you know, I come to find out, I grew up in a church when I, and we laugh about it now. It's a group of us that come together. We're still all friends. And we became friends because we had to cover each other against the parishioners of the church. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. They were also, they were so prophetic. And we were too in the audience. But they were like, we literally, church started at 11 o'clock on a Sunday. At nine o'clock, every last one of us, without even knowing it, was on our face asking God, please make us holy, strong, fix us. Because we don't want to be called out and embarrassed at church. Because there was no way we were going to have... Church was not church until somebody got called out. You got that right. I'm talking about every Sunday. Not, not every time we came through the door. Somebody had sinned. Somebody had been laying on their back. Somebody had gone where they should not have gone. Somebody had said what they should not have said. So we were scared of this God. He was not our friend. He wasn't kind either, nor loving. He wasn't, ah, but father, you were lying. Now, he may be my father, but. You were lying. He, he, mm -hmm. And the only reason I'm staying here is because I'm too scared to go to hell. Right. Do you know I spent my 21st birthday in the middle of the floor crying because I was saved? Because the church had deemed this horrible God that I now had to serve. And if I backslid, Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I only got seven times worse. And where I came from, sometimes worse, I just they would count me out. Because mm -mm. when I got saved that time, they told me that God had just let me slide in because he had prepared a car. I'm, I'm not being, I'm being verbatim what they told me on that Friday night, which probably was sun Saturday morning by the time they got through with that tearing service. They told me that because I hadn't f received full deliverance that night, God said that was it. It was over. And when I walked out of the house, uh, out of the church, as crossing the street, God says a truck will come and kill me, bringing me to my end. Exact words. And people around started crying because, of course, this is the word of the Lord. So shall it be, right? Mm-hmm. And, and in my in, every, now, 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 I've never been short on words. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, I'm sorry. I don't. If I'm a, I'm already according to you. I'm dead now, anyway. You know. So I might as well tell you what I got to say prior to because I did everything you told me to do. You told me to lift my hands. You told me to turn around. You told me to bow. You told me to roll on the ground. I did everything. If something did not happen that should have happened, that's on you. I refuse to take accountability for something I do not even know what you're talking about. And now I got to die? Quit your crying, is what I told the person. <laughs> Stop that. I'll see you Sunday. And now it's been 20 years of Sundays later. Hello. Like the manipulation. Now, mind you, this person, I'm not just telling you there was a fake because they prophesied other things so many other times that came 100% to pass. But because of our ignorance, we don't know. We don't. We don't know that just because you have a track record doesn't mean you can't be all. Doesn't mean that God's grace. You, you know what I'm saying? Can't forgive yeah, you know. when you mess up. Because someone had prophesied to me one time. They were like, "I see you smoking." I'm like, "I don't know where he pulling that from." Because you must have went back to 1998 um, when I was in high school, sir. Yeah. I you know, that's a whole nother thing. I'm not even going to get into <laughs> to the profit part because they're so, I put a post on and it disturbed a couple people. I put up because, you know, churches have MITs, like ministers in training. They have deacons classes. They have classes for mothers and all this. Where's the prophets classes? Because some of these people have to go. We need to go. No, no, because when they started, when they start having some of them school of the prophets, they even got more spookier and more confusing with all of that, which is the reason why Half them schools even exist today in 2020. 
Because they been training up. Yeah, they you know, just no. can't. You just can't go up and just start doing. You know, because I mean, the truth is, they got minister classes that are spooky, or you know, they, they didn't really. I've been in some classes. Now I'm gonna leave that there. And I was culture classes, and I'm like, this ain't, this ain't, this no. This ain't I, it. This this doesn't even. This not even for me. This not even for God. This is just a a um a club of men that have come together to swap stories about their wives and shop and stop and swap stories about my church is growing. God is adding to the church, which has no edification for us who were coming up in gospel. You know, we're, this is, this was, and, and, and I'm out, it's, it's here now. I was in elders council. Mm -hmm. I was a minister and you had to go through this elders council in order to, before you can be elevated, you had to, you know, all those different, and I, I believe in that. I believe and try. I do too. You know, all them but I sat questions. there. I, listen, they gave me four, and I sat there and cried as I answered them, and they kept telling me to calm down. But I was crying. One, because I couldn't believe I was here after I told God no. And then these people are looking at me, and they were writing. It wasn't a board like on a table. They sat in the bishop's office around, and they all sat together. And I'm right in the middle, so they're right here. And they literally had to stop me and say, sir, we know now, I'm going to tell you what they actually said. They said, you are smarter than about 80% of us in here, which scared me because if I'm looking up to you, 80%? 80. Not half. You said 80. Whole 80. Some ain't right. But those, so I've been a part of things that weren't as productive. We'll say that. But there still needs to be something. I agree. You know, um, and then, you know, pray and ask God to please help and cover and protect <laughs> as we move forward. But healing, healing. My first step, and I said it on my, on my, um, in my series, is self-awareness and self-ownership. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times, and it's not that we are not telling the truth, but we're not taking ownership of our part. And it's hard and difficult because sometimes you didn't know it was your part. You came in just ready to receive. And, and I remember your testimony for last week. You said that you, were, you came from another faith. You came from Catholic. So you didn't know all of the ins and outs and what. Get it. But you still had a part in allowing and so it does not become, I blame myself. Mm -mm. No, I don't. But I do take, I was six years old when a lady, an evangelist walked up to me, six years old, and said, you are gay and you are going to hell. Six. I hadn't discovered what gay was, but I sure knew what hell was. And I did not want to go. <laughs> I wish if I had a six-year-old, if some evangelist would go up to my child and tell my child they gay and going to hell, she would have caught these good hands. No, well, mm -mm. I went back and told my mother, and I wasn't going to tell on her. I was going because I needed to repent about something, but I don't know what gay is. So can you help me so I can stop this? Because I don't want to go to hell. Because I was a church kid. You know, you couldn't pay me not to be in church. But even at that age, I allowed in my innocence a word curse to be spoken over me and traumatized me for years to go. So when I needed healing, and I want you to know the healing was last year, that wow. part of the healing. Mm -hmm. And I was on, God had arranged a whole thing without my, of course, permission, because I would have fought as I normally do. I went back to the very city, to the very church where I accepted this word curse, even in my ignorance, in my innocence of not knowing, to rebuke, disallow, and annul mm -hmm. that this shall no longer hang over my head. But I had to take accountability that, David, even in your six years old, you did not know, but it did happen. Right. And so God, in my innocence, reverse. I release 
the acceptance of it. Mm -hmm. Because we accepted that stuff that they said. When they said your shirt is your short your your skirt is too short, you a Jezebel spirit, which has nothing to do with Jezebel. But they they just mad at your curves. I hate the curves. They mad at your curves, or, or the fact that they know they husband looking at you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Or they can't get a husband, and the person they want won't you. All of those things happen right in the church because in people church. are people. People mm -hmm. are people, and so you deal with. But you don't know because you're just there trying to serve the Lord. <laughs> and they have the title, so they should know. But and you've you, accepted. You give your freedom to them. But you need to go get your freedom back. Right. Even though it's retro. It happened. But your mind don't know it. Your body don't know it. That's the psychological ramification. The echo that we have in generational curses is a psychological phenomenon. Mm. This is, and see, we've, we've done, and this, this is my thing as well, because the, the world has, and the church especially, have separated psychology versus church. You couldn't go see a therapist when you were in church, because that means you didn't trust God. And if you needed to go see a, a counselor, that's what the pastor there for. Past? What? What do you mean? The past? He don't. He don't. He needs to go see a counselor. <laughs> Let's be real. He don't know how to deal with his own. His own stuff. His house is a muck. In fact, he is a muck. Hello. And you want him to real. counsel me? And that's what. And the mother, she jealous of me, and that's who got to counsel me. She don't even like me at all. Mm -hmm. Do you hear me? But mm -hmm. So why wouldn't I go? But we taught that against each other. Now, some of it was systemic because we couldn't afford it before. If we go back far enough. So we made do, but, and we made, our feel, we made justifications that God was so that we didn't feel like we were less than. That's in there too. And then as time progressed, when it was available, we went back with what we were comfortable with. Because right. then now we feel like we're, we're being disloyal to our heritage. Right. Which we got to understand, first of all, the only people that taught the Bible to the black people were other black people who only learned to read as Massa told them what they read. Mm -hmm. So who Bible did you really get anyway? Now, I mean, I'm not going to really go down that road real far. But it is a road. Mm -hmm. But it is a road that you got to consider that the paper, they did not have, our, our ancestors did not have education to be able they couldn't they couldn't even pronounce exegete much less do it hello so we got to be able to understand now i was told and i meant i loved it and i said everywhere i go there was there was um a a, a dean of chapel when i was in seminary and on on our first collective body um chapel service he said ch black, the black church now mind you there was all type of people there so it wasn't a black you know, it was, mm -hmm. but he, he specified that the black church especially is the only church where, okay, if you want a lawyer, you go and check their records. You go and see what school they went to, what is their ratings and all that. If you want a doctor and this has to be a specialist, you want to see how many cases, how long they've been in practice, what are the re rates and reviews. When the last time you are never checked the ratings of your pastor? Is there even a place to do so? What college did he go to? He went. And yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not yeah, doubting. From where? Do you see what I'm saying? Most of these pastors that I know growing up, they heard God call them in the sky. Right. They heard a burning sensation. They woke up one morning. I'm not telling you that wasn't God, but I do know that that could be God. But why did you? I, it would it would have been so nice if you went to school so you know how to rightly divide. That was. Let me say this. That was one of the things I never forget when I first started preaching. And Lord knows I love my mother, but one of the things that she said to me, she said, "Nakia, how is it possible?" that you can start preaching and you haven't gone through seminary she said i don't understand a church that allows you to preach a word that you haven't even received a degree in like she said it and i was like and hear me in all of my <laughs> right 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 i'm called by god yep 
I don't need no man-made piece of paper to make me legitimate to do X, Y, and Z because the Holy Spirit will speak through me. However, now that I'm older and I begin to understand I can be called by God. And I'm not saying that you need to go to seminary, but there are so many things that we have been taught that have been erroneous and that have been completely false that it would behoove you to gain some type of degree. Or at least get certification. Take a couple classes. Do something. Do something. Act like you really love God and his people. Mm-hmm. Or now your call. A, there's a question that came in here. So the person said, I don't know who this is, but they said, um, so do you think that that evangelist spoke gay over your life? No, I don't think that she spoke. And, and I'm taking the question as like, when she spoke it, then I began. Uh-huh. Yeah, because that's gay. what she is. No, mm-hmm. I don't think that she spoke gay over my life. However, I think that she spoke condemnation over my life. Because from that moment on, I, I was chasing not being what she said. I, I lived my life to prove. I was a virgin until 31, proving that I was not. And I'm talking about a virgin of everything. I'm not talking about I dipped over here. You couldn't hug me long. Cause I, because what happened was I began this defense because I felt if I did not know what my attraction was, I could not ever be. Right. Mm-hmm. So even as a child, when, it, my, when I was explaining what gay was, was that men, men who liked to sleep or did sleep with men. Well, I didn't sleep with anybody, so I wasn't gay. So I was fine. But by the time I knew puberty was coming and they said that feelings start to arise and you start to know what you're attracted to, we got to start building up some defenses so that won't ever happen. So asexual was my goal. Oh, okay. But it was fostered by the church. And the problem, the greatest problem, because people, of course, you, you 24, 25, and you telling people, oh, I'm, I'm a virgin, they're applauding you. Because in the yes. church, that's wonderful. That was the most backward. And I'm not talking about I should have sex. But I, what they did not realize, and I don't blame them, or, but what they did not know is that I'm now taking my mental somewhere where it's going to need some extra healing. By the time I'm ready to have any relationship, there's damage. Damage. Because you don't know how to hug somebody. You can't even hug. You don't know how to relate emotionally. To I can't allow you. And so the problem is that emotions come out of you whether you want them or not. Yeah. So since I wasn't able to love, I was able to still express the same emotion intensely in evilness and hatred. So I was an evil whore. (laughs) I mean, if you batted your eye wrong, I had already worn you out. Yeah, I was one of them ones that my family, walked, when I walked in the front door, my family escaped through the back door. Oh, here he is. That was my life. But it was all, I mean, it was just all of this bitterness, all of this um, um, un- unexpressed love, unexpressed portals to be loved. Because the church told me, or actually because the evangelist mm-hmm. told uh, me the lie that continued to grow and, and escalate into something that that became out of hand. But ask me, actually, the truth is the way it started regressing was through love again. I had an auntie who, the highs and lows, but the high was she loved me unconditionally and I felt she didn't have to say I even love you. She told me, it was, you know how in the church they have anniversaries and they old time they used to go plant the flowers or put mm-hmm. the side side. so I was putting the, the cassage on her arm and she looked at me and said what an honor and when she said it the love I can literally cry now because I can feel the same intensity that I was actually in the occult at that time I had started practicing witchcraft at that time that's how far mm-hmm. away from the church I had to go in my mind and the lo- that statement that was filled with love penetrated all the way down to the core of me, and I had to leave the service. You hear me? Wow. I got to get out of here. I don't know what that is. I don't like it. I'm leaving. 
But that was the, 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 the love that started. That's the love and kindness that draws. It wasn't a judgment. It didn't even matter. She does not agree with the life of, of, of homosexuality or any of that. It, but that wasn't her point. That's God's job. My job is to love. And if we would do what God told us to do and not do his job and be in his way, we could see the fruition of love in his house. And I think that that right there is major because you don't have to agree. Mm -hmm. But you should still be able to show love. Yeah. You should still be able to show kindness you should still be able to show humility. Mm -hmm. You should still be, you should still be able to show what God said that you should show mm 